Well, good. Good morning, everyone. Glad morning. that you're with us today. Uh, we're all looking at our phones like we like we're not online too. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Sorry for that. I just got a text that I needed to answer. So anyway, that's there. So hope you're doing well. I see something right here on the screen. It's driving me crazy here. Oh. Clean. I got to clean your real screen off. So it looks good. There's a spot right. It looked like I was um, a different religion with a spot in the middle of my head. I had to get it off. <laughs> it would have been distracting the whole time. Sorry. <laughs> well, yesterday we. Um, I have to correct something from yesterday. Yesterday we were talking about, um, and we're still we still will today. We're talking about this this time period of 40 days between the first the, the the resurrection of Christ and the ascension of Christ so this this time period where Jesus was after his resurrection was alive on earth in his in his resurrected body during that 40 days and I and I said something yesterday because I was trying to read it really fast and I messed it up and I and it didn't sound right to me when I said it but I thought well okay but anyway I need to correct something um I'll and I'll read that for you in a minute but First of all, let's talk about what we need to pray for. We're, and so we're not going to be in any specific passage of Scripture. We'll be, um, we'll be in lots of Scripture talking about those 40-day time periods. Uh, anyway, so what do you have to pray for today? Anything, Pastor? I mean, really, I think it's uh, the coming elections. Um, that, that, that's weighing heavy in my heart, you know, that people vote and vote for the right things. Um, yeah. Of course, this weekend with different churches doing different outreaches. Yeah, yeah, this weekend's a big weekend for outside stuff, huh? Yeah. And so, uh, I don't know, I'm sure there are a lot of churches doing different things. I don't know exactly what they are. I don't, you know, I haven't seen anything, but you probably, you keep a, a, a breast of that more than most, so. Yeah, what's happening, a lot of churches are having to go outside and do drive through and uh, that's what it had on the Riverside County Health website, to, that you're, you're allowed to do like drive through in cars, Church, you mean? Churches are allowed to do that. We're that, doing a drive-through church. No, what I'm saying on the. I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, that's I'm really okay. no I, I'm going. Wait, we're doing what? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I mean, wait. You're right. Not drive-through church. I'm sorry. For Harvest Fest. Oh, Harvest, harvest Fest. Fest. Oh. I did not say. No, that. no, that's okay. I'm thinking <laughs> no. we do a drive. We hardly no, no, changed no, no, no. it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, we had a plan. I didn't have. A... <laughs> no, not that. For Harvest Fest tomorrow night. For a Harvest, me... okay. Now, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, no, my bad. I should have known that. I didn't. I didn't I'm sorry. No. <laughs> but the County of Riverside, had, had, they, they have this whole list of uh -huh. uh, do's, do nots, and one of them is. An alternative, safe way to do har you know, to go out and get candy, like Halloween stuff. Yeah, it's Halloween we do stuff. harvest festival instead of Halloween. Drive yeah. through and get candy, and that's what we're doing. And a lot, that's, I think, the only thing that churches can do. Uh -huh. I know one church that um, they're doing everything inside. So oh. yeah, um, so yeah, that thing, and th that's another thing that you know, I realize we we need to pray for churches. I realize churches that are non-denominational churches. Are really are more the ones that are kind of staying open inside. Every church I, I've talked to, like five different churches, all non-denominational, are staying open, and so that's fine. That's what God has called them to do. But I've and I've seen in denominations, it's kind of the opposite to where they're doing more things outside, like what we're doing. So, okay, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know if it's denominational or not, but that's interesting yeah. for you to, to put that together. That's interesting. Yeah, it was just, yeah, yeah it was. So. Yeah. Well, that's good. That that's good. That at least we know a little bit about what's going on. We the the thing about the thing about churches meeting indoors. We want them to meet indoors. We want them to do whatever they think they're supposed to do. Um, we live in the United States. We're supposed to have a freedom of speech. We want yes. we want that to take place. Uh, but one of the things that I think is important for us to pray for um, when we talk about prayer is the churches that are meeting inside. The churches that are meeting. Um, and not following the, the the rules from the county or the state or whatever. Uh, those churches, it's interesting because because if there's a great breakout, if something happens there um, and they have a, a COVID breakout in those churches, it's going to reflect badly on the entire yeah. church. So, you know, I, I'm just praying that they stay safe. <laughs> and they and it's kind of a like we've talked about this before. It's kind of a selfish prayer because I don't want to get in trouble um, for what somebody else does. But we're all going to get thrown into the same pot if that happens. So, yeah. 
So I think we need to just pray that, that everybody stays healthy and that people don't contract it. One of the reasons we have, there are two reasons that we haven't uh, defied, at this point anyway, we haven't defied any orders that have been given to us through the county. First one is that I think scripture tells us that we're supposed to follow our governmental rules. And so I want to do that. I want to do what scripture says. Secondly, and it, and, and this is not as important as the first one, but secondly, um, insurance purposes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we if If we meet together and something were to happen and someone was to get sick or something and something were to happen, um, the problem is is that our insurance co- our insurance wouldn't cover it, so we would be in big trouble yes. if something happened because we were we were and it wouldn't even have to be COVID related. Anything that we did or any, that that we're not supposed to be doing as far as the state is concerned, the insurance company would use that to say, "I'm sorry, we're not gonna we're not gonna back you up here," and so that could get that could get the church in a lot of trouble. So so you know I I, I need to make sure that we're protecting. The body of Christ. Now, if, if 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 some, and I pray this never happens, but if someday someone were to say, you know, you can't worship God anymore, then I would just say, I'm really sorry. I'm, I can't follow that. There are some things that you can't follow. And anytime, I think anytime people tell you that you can't re, can't reach out to your God, that you can't, you're you're restricted and you can't do something to pray. You can't read your word. You can't. When they start telling us that kind of stuff, that I don't, I don't think that any longer applies because because that goes directly against the Word of God when the when the Word of God tells us to do certain things. So that's or again, the Word of God can always has to be your guide, and I think that we should maybe talk about that someday. When when is the church when is the church okay to not follow the civil law of the United States or the government or the state or city or whatever? When is the church okay not to do that? We should probably talk about that sometime, but today we don't have time to. But we should pray that when people do that, that they don't get in trouble because we all get lumped in with that. And then you know, yes. it's hard for all of us to, to deal with that. But, you know, it, but God will give us the grace if that does happen. God will give us the grace. But I hope, hopefully, that people will not be not be sick. We don't want people to be sick anyway. That's, you know, we want people to be well and healthy. We always have and we always yes. will. Yeah. So anyway, that's a, that's a prayer concern. Um, prayer concerns for our families. Uh, I know that we all have families. I, again, I was talking to a, a, a gentleman two days ago and I told you this, um, <coughs> excuse me, talking to a gentleman two days ago and he's concerned about his children and he he's a great Bible student. This this person he's a, he's a dentist, Doctor Becker from Seattle, and he might be watching. Hi Dan, if you're on, Dan's a great guy, <laughs> and uh, he's he's a, an extremely bright bright man, and um, and he is an amazing scholar. He loves and he really he has a certain way uh, that he thinks about things, but he knows what he thinks, and he's really good at what he thinks. So and he knows other people's thoughts as well, but. He's a very he's a very great student, a uh, very bright man. And anyway, he he and I talked about it. We in in the, the very very easily the things that need to line up to happen for the end of the world to come could line up and happen very quickly. And and we talked about that. So you know, we want our children, we want our families to be. You already find a prayer request. Yes. Yeah. We want our children, we want our families to be to be um, safe in Christ. We want them. To be with us in eternity, we don't want them to to be in hell. We want them to be with Christ, and so we're praying for our children. That's a huge, huge, huge request for many people, and so we should pray for our families today. And pray for pray for the elections. Pray for the results of the elections. Pray that people will honor the results of the elections and not go crazy and do stupid things. <laughs> and people kind of already are. Yeah, people I know. already are. <laughs> I know. It's it's the civil unrest just because people don't get their way is we, we we have in this country we really have done a huge disservice and and taken God out and taken the morals and the ethics that God had planned for us as human beings, taken them away from uh, away from mainstream and um, you know we're paying the crap price for that. People are very selfish and very self-centered, and they're 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 big babies and big brats. Honestly, they really are. And it's like you know I'm not getting my way. I'm gonna you know throw a temper tantrum and tear down your building and you know riot and all that kind of stuff. That's just a temper tantrum. That's all that is. That's nothing more than that. Most of those most of those people don't have any clue what they're even doing. I don't think. And uh, 
it's a very sad thing. A few people are leading a whole lot of people down the wrong path. And the other thing that I don't understand that people are destroying places where you drop off your uh, your ballots. Your ballots. I mean, yeah. it's more and more, and I'm like, why would you do that? I don't understand that. Well, again, I don't think people don't they don't know what they're doing. They're just yeah. you know, it's but, yeah. it's just it's ridiculous, right? It is. And then yeah. on the good note, actually, more people there are more ballots right now that are being mailed in. I think last yeah. I saw was like thirty, forty million. Yeah, there's a lot. So that's 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 a good thing. People are people voting. are participating. That's people are good participating, thing. Yeah. which is really good. Yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah. All right. Well. Let's let's pray. Anything else you got in there? That you yeah, said? Um, what'd, you, what'd you see? Uh, Tina Dehe's mom's oh, right. yeah. surgery today. Right. Um, and then the other one, and that's for a uh, for stents, I believe. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then Jenna Lee has a friend. Right. Um, oh my goodness! <laughs> the lady had a baby. She had a baby, and she got gangrene. Yes. And she got an infection, and they're trying to figure that out. Yes, take care of that. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the one. Is, is, is that sound yes. right? Yeah, I think yes. that's what I read. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we need to pray for those things as well. So, anyway, you want to lead us in prayer sure. today? Thanks. Lord, um, we thank you for this morning. Um, Lord, we just, uh, there's so much in our hearts. I think that between uh, myself, Rick, and those that are watching, and mm -hmm. Lord, and, um, Lord, we know, Lord, that from the minute that we get up, even when we sleep, Lord, we can rest in you. Mm -hmm. Lord, uh, you know, we have said it, it's not for a battle of power, but for truth in such a time that we're in, Lord. And so we would ask, Father, today, um, we would ask you, Holy Spirit, would you, would you just begin to move the midst of your church? Would you begin to move in the midst of those who are, do not know Christ as their Lord and Savior, Father? We would ask, Father, that you just today um, bring a peace, a calmness upon our hearts, upon our soul, Lord. That, you know, that we can rest in you. We pray, as Rick has said, for for our children, Lord, um, for our own kids. And such a time, Lord, where, you know, this COVID, this pandemic and the lockdown has really affected their, their minds, their souls. So we would ask, Lord, do only something that you can do in their lives. Um, we pray for the elections, Lord, um, for that. We thank you that people are, are voting, but we also pray for those individuals, Lord, that are doing things that are just not right. But we would pray, Lord, as election day comes, Lord, for uh, protection upon the various places that are hosting the uh, places for people to cast their ballots and drop them off. And we pray for you will be done and for us as believers, Lord, to uh, make correct, uh, as we vote, uh, we vote according to your word. Lord, we pray also for uh, Tina D, his mom today, Lord, for the surgery, and then for this gal, Lord, um, who has an infection. We would ask, Father God, please have your way with that. Yes. Please, Father, uh, we pray today for your word, Lord. Um, just move us in such a way, Lord, for us to understand as we're going to see uh, how Christ appeared, Father, 40 days after he was re resurrected. And how, Lord, that gives us such hope for today. Lord, you're the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so we would invite you, Lord, that um, have your way with us today as we learn from it and the things that we can apply, Father. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord, we are so grateful for all you do for us. We pray for all those things. I agree with every one of those things that Pastor Uriel has prayed. And we also pray for our families, for our children. We pray, Lord Jesus, for their salvation. We pray that you would be the hound of heaven after them, that they are your children. Um, they're not really ours. They don't belong to us. They, sure. They're yours. And, and so, Father, no human being owns another one in your economy. And uh, and we don't own our children. They belong to you. We're just stewards over them. And so, Father, we pray right now that you would take your children that we love and that you would minister to them and that you would give them uh, a sense of knowing you and loving you like they've never known. I pray that our children would fall in love with you, Lord Jesus, all of our children. Um, the adult children and young children, Lord Jesus. We pray for the fathers and the mothers who have hearts that grieve over the behavior of their children. And we ask, God, that you would minister to the hearts, bring comfort and care and peace, Lord Jesus. Bring the truth to families, Lord, we pray. The truth of Jesus Christ and the wonderful news, the good news, the wonderful news of the gospel. Bring it to our families in Jesus' name. Yes. We pray, Father, you do that for our communities as well. We pray that for India. We pray for the other churches who are meeting and not following for whatever reason they decided. They're not following your 
your uh, the guidelines, Lord Jesus, of of the of the the county or the state or anybody else, and, and they feel like they're not supposed to, Lord, for whatever reason they feel that way. I pray that you would protect them, and I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would let people stay safe in those places, and that that no disaster would come upon them at this time. Thank you, Jesus, for ministering to them. Thank you, Father. Just keep them safe. Keep us all safe. Let us have a wonderful, glorious worship service. I'm excited about our worship service on Sunday. I'm excited about um, sitting outside and blaring the music and having the neighbors, Lord, to hear it, and hopefully they won't be too upset. Father, I pray that you would keep everything wonderful, Lord Jesus, and, and safe, and that you would keep us safe Sunday, that you would let us... Uh, be able to handle all the issues that come our way and that you would just take care of everything that happens. Lord, we love you and, and we want to honor you in everything we do. And we ask that Sunday morning, Lord, your Holy Spirit would come. We pray for a, we pray for a uh, opening in the atmosphere, Lord Jesus, that's a, that's a direct opening to you that the sinful things of this world, Lord God, could not come upon this campus, but that you, Lord Jesus, your Holy Spirit would be here and that people would come on this campus and begin to begin to repent and begin to begin to really worship you in spirit and in truth the way that you call us to we pray for all that to take place lord i know that's what you want and so i pray father that your will be done in people's lives on sunday morning and that great revival hang begins to start and and continue in a mighty way let there be a mighty rushing wind lord jesus a strong fire of the spirit lord in this place thank you father for that in jesus holy and precious name we love you god we praise you and we ask that you would help us to understand resurrection power today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, yesterday we got to, and I and, and now Uriel has a copy of the thing that I printed out. Um, <coughs> excuse me. That's the car I rented. That was fun. That black brown. <coughs> anyway, we got to, um, we got to the fourth, I believe. The fourth, yes, we did. We got to the fourth appearance, but I want to go back to the very first. Um, in, in Matthew 28, 1, it, be, it begins to talk about this appearance. Um, uh, and Mary Magdalene and the other Marys came towards the tomb, and they saw that the tomb was opened, and they were alarmed. Now, in John 20, verse 2, we don't need to read it because we're just going to go clean this up a little bit. Mary Magdalene, and I and I was reading this on the plane. I had a couple hours on the plane yesterday, and I was reading all this over again so that because I, I knew what we talked about yesterday was in such a hurry. I thought something's not right, so I went back. So I have to apologize for not getting it correct yesterday. So hopefully we'll straighten that out today. So Mary Magdalene runs off to Peter and John. She alone runs off to Peter and John with this distressing news that the that the grave is open, and she's distressed about it because she thinks that it's been grave robbers. That's the, yeah. that's the problem. So, and, and, and yesterday I said, well, there couldn't have been grave robbers because of the, the guards. And that's true. There couldn't have been grave robbers. But she thinks there maybe have been some grave robbers, and there have been many of them. And that's the thing that I didn't quite have a conversation about correctly yesterday, and I wanted to clear that up. So anyway, um, I want to communicate it correctly. So anyway, there was this. She goes to them in John 20, chapter 20, verse 2, she runs back just Mary Magdalene does. The, uh, the women who remain at the tomb, they're the ones who encounter the angel and who, and who declares uh, to them that Jesus has risen and they should tell this to the brethren, to the, to the disciples. And we gave you scripture for that yesterday. That's in Mark 16, Luke 24, and Matthew 28. Um, at first, the women were filled with fear and departed from the tomb afraid to speak. That's found in Mark 16, 8. They didn't want to say anything. They, uh, recovering their courage, they decided to go to the apostles because they were told to go to the apostles, remember? Luke, and that's Luke 24, 9 and Matthew 28, 8. Meanwhile, while all this is happening, Peter and John go back to the tomb to investigate Mary Magdalene's claim. So, so here you have this encounter with an angel with Mary Magdalene, I mean, the encounter with the tomb with Mary Magdalene, she runs, the other women stay, she runs to go tell everybody what's going on. And while she's doing that, an angel encounters the other, the other women remaining there. They're afraid, but then they decide to go. While they're going to try to find all the followers of Christ, the disciples, John and Peter come back to the tomb 
with, and, and I don't know if Mary Magdalene comes with them or not, but John, the, John and Peter come back to the tomb. That's all in here. This is pretty good, isn't it? This guy yeah, did no, a, it's a good this, this guy did a thorough uh, investigation of it, whoever he is. Um, so meanwhile, Peter and John go to the tomb to investigate Mary Magdalene's claim. Mary follows behind them. So there you go. That's that's what happens. I don't I, behind them. I don't mean what I mean is I'm not sure she was with them, but she was there with them. Arriving back at the tomb while Peter and John are still there, Peter and John, Peter and John then discover the empty tomb. They encounter no angel. John believes in the resurrection. Peter's conclusion is not recorded. So we're not, we don't know at this point what Peter thinks. But John immediately believes that, that the resurrection has happened. He sees the empty tomb. He goes, I know what happened because Jesus told us. We're not, we're not sure what Peter's re response was. Now, the other women report to the remaining apostles, not Peter and John because they're away from them, report to the remaining disciples what the angel at the tomb said to them. And Peter and John have not yet returned from the tomb, and these remaining apostles are at first dismissed by the women's, uh, dismissive of the women's story. Remember, we read that yesterday. Yeah. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe that what these women were saying. Then Mary Magdalene, she lingers at the tomb. She stays at the tomb. Remember, she followed behind Peter and John, and she stays there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's see, where am I at here? Uh, da, 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 da. Lingers at the tomb, weeps, and is fearful. Peering into the tomb, she sees, uh, she sees this time two angels who wonder, wondering why, she's weep, why she weeps. Jesus then approaches her from behind, not looking directly at Jesus, she supposes him to be the gardener. When he calls her by name, Mary recognizes his voice, turns and sees him. Filled with joy, she clings to him. That's the first appearance of Jesus. So the first time that Jesus appears to anybody, the empty tomb is there and people are running back and forth and we see yeah. all that. But the first time that, that Jesus appears to somebody, and this is John 20, verse 16, the first time there's an appearance of Christ, it's to Mary Magdalene. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. So we talked about that yesterday. Um, and so then the second appearance, the other women, uh, let's see, Jesus sends Mary back to the apostles with the news to prepare them uh, for his later appearance of that day in John 20, verse 17. The other women have now departed from the apostles and are on their way pro and probably back home, it says. Jesus appears to them in Matthew 28, 9. After having dispatched Mary, he also sends them back to the apostles with the news that he has risen and he will see them. Now, that's the second appearance. Okay, we talked about, again, we're, we're going to catch up to the four ones that we saw yesterday. So that's the second appearance. And, and I think it's amazing, and we talked about this yesterday, I think it's amazing that <laughs> Jesus appears to the women first. And, and I, I think it's because, I told you this yesterday, but I really think it's important, they are the ones with the courage. The, the, the apostles weren't doing anything but sitting in a room trying to figure out what to do. Mary and other, the, other, the other Mary and women went to the tomb. They were the ones that stood at the cross. Remember we reported that? They were the ones that stood just a little off distance from the cross watching everything that was going on with Jesus. The apostles didn't. They all scattered. Yeah, the only the one was, was John. John, right. John was the only one. John, John and, and the women were the only women. Yeah. And we know John because, go ahead, tell, tell us that story. Well, he was there because Peter, I mean, uh, Jesus. Jesus looked down mm -hmm. to John and he said to him, Behold, your mother. Behold, this is your mom now. You take care of her. Yeah, behold your mother, yeah. yeah. And then here in John 20, you're talking about Peter. Peter doesn't go in. Right. But John does. Right. So, right. yeah, you see John's about the only one that yeah, so had some courage. It's the women and John, and John. that are, that are and, then, and he's not supposed to be the, the tough, rough, you know, mean, you know, Peter is. But Peter's yeah. kind of lagging back a little bit, right? Peter's fickle. Yeah, he's fickle. <laughs> so, so, the, so these other women now depart from the other disciples, and, and Jesus appears to them. Okay, that's the second appearance. Now... There's going to be 40 days of these of these appearances where Jesus has been raised from the dead. Remember, this is after the resurrection. That's why that's why this is important. Later that day, there were two disciples on their way to Emmaus, and they're wondering what's going on. We talked about that. Jesus meets with them on the way to Emmaus. He starts talking with them. They say, "Don't you know what's going on?" And he says, "Tell me." You know, 
Tell me what's going on. And so that happens. That's in Luke 24. That happens. And guess what? Then he goes with them and he has a meal with them and he breaks bread with them. As soon as he breaks the bread with them on the road to Emmaus, they recognize who he is. And so that's the third appearance. Now they, the, 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 the two people, the two disciples, they return to Jerusalem after that meeting. They go back to Jerusalem probably later, not probably not late, late at night, but later in the evening. They go back, excuse me, to Jerusalem where the other 11 are. Remember, there were 12 disciples, but Judas killed himself, so now there's 11. So he yeah. goes back to the other 11. And, and, they, and those 11 uh, disbelieve them just this is crazy <laughs> they keep getting these eyewitness accounts but they don't want to believe these other 11 these 11 after they hear from the guys they disbelieve him in mark 16 13 they just like they disbelieve the women they disbelieve they don't believe these two these two uh, followers of christ that have talked to jesus on the road to emmaus yeah and this word disbelieve it's not to the point like, oh, we don't believe. They were just really with hesitation. Yeah, like, it was. They were pondering, how could this be? Yeah, What's going yes, on? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they weren't. They weren't bought in. They didn't. No, they hadn't weren't. bought into it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's the problem. They hadn't bought into it yet. Okay. Nevertheless, um, uh, what, let me see. Uh, what are they here? Uh, uh, they nevertheless they continue. It says here to relate what they have experienced. Okay, they they can they they these two disciples continue to say this is what this is what happened this is what happened. At some point, Peter draws apart from the others. So, you know, this says perhaps he goes on a walk. I don't know, but somehow Peter goes and leaves the re the other eleven and the other followers that are there. the The eleven are called the apostles. Everybody else is a disciple or follower of Jesus. So the apostles, the, they, the, when it says the eleven, that's who we're talking about. So Peter kind of gets off by himself somehow. And then in the fourth appearance, this is in Luke 24 and in 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about this both. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians. And how does Paul know about it? Well, because Paul has been with Peter and Peter's told him about it. Yeah. He knows all about it. So, but, the, but it's recorded in Luke 24, 34. While Peter is out by himself, Jesus appears to Peter. It also says in First First Corinthians, and that's the fourth appearance. It also says in First Corinthians fifteen five, Peter gives. I mean, excuse me, Paul gives a little list of where Jesus has appeared because again, it's important. It's important enough for Paul to give you a kind of list of where he appeared, and he does. Yeah. And he says in First Corinthians fifteen five that Jesus appears to more than five hundred people at one time. And Josephus, who is a historian, and several other historians write about this conversation about Jesus being seen by his disciples, and 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 many of them would see him at the same time. Yeah, with yeah. Peter, there's no account; it's not mentioned in the Gospels, but it is mentioned, like you said, Paul talks about it. Yeah, and the Scripture, the only two accounts that yeah, Luke twenty four, yeah, thirty four, the only accounts where where this yes. that this a fourth appearance is yes. mentioned. So Peter then goes back and he take, goes and talks to the other ten, right? And, and uh, who they, after Peter says, I've seen him, then they believe, but not really completely. They're still doubting Thomas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> then the disciples from Emmaus, still lingering, they're still with the apostles, are now told, perhaps by the way of apology, that it is indeed true that Jesus has risen. And that's, again, Luke 24, 34. One of the things that I see that... What does Luke 24, 34 say? Do you have it there? Yeah. Okay, I thought you did. What does it say? Watch this. And it's... Let me back up to 33. And within the hour, they were on the way back to Jerusalem, and there they found the eleven disciples and the others who had gathered with them. And this is verse 34. Who said, The Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Yeah, he appeared to Peter, so... That's the only place it says that. So almost, yeah, you were going to say something else, sorry. No, one of the things that I see that the word that keeps popping up is a ghost, a ghost, a ghost. And that's part of the, the problem that they have, that they're well, thinking. Yeah, we haven't seen that yet. Yeah. We'll see yeah, that. We'll see yeah, 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 yeah. We haven't seen that I'm yet. I'm jumping ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's the fourth appearance. Now, almost at the same moment, Jesus appears to a small gathering of apostles and two disciples from Emmaus. That's that's the fifth appearance that happens. Thomas is not there. 
Thomas is not there. All right? And that's the problem, that Thomas isn't there when this happens. They are startled, but Jesus, and this is the ghost conversation, they are startled, but Jesus reassures them and opens the scripture to them and teaches them. So when you ask, why did Jesus come back in a resurrected state with a resurrected body? Why did he come back and why did he stay for 40 days? Most of, most people will tell you one of the major reasons, because scripture says it, is that he needed to continue to teach them and continue to do miracles. And that's what he does. He teaches them here. And that's found in Luke, you're still in Luke 24. What's Luke 24, 36 and a few verses after that say? You see it? Back at the 35. Yeah, okay. 36, you said? No, that's fine. 35, seven. Um It says, And the two from Emmaus told their story how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. Verse 36. Right. And just as they were telling and just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. Yeah. So it's it's a it it's be, that's the ghost conversation that, that part of that that you're just talking about because Jesus just appears. He, you know, he walks through walls. He, you know, just he just appears, and so he's with them, and and he and he says, "Don't be afraid." Keep reading a few verses after that. There's some there's some red letter after that, isn't there? Yeah, he okay, says. This is what Jesus said, verse thirty seven. But the whole group was startled, frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. And yeah. then Jesus says in verse thirty eight, "Why are you frightened?" He asked. "Why are your hearts filled with doubt?" Look at look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that there, it is really it is really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost, because ghosts do not have bodies, as you see that I do. Okay. Now this is important. Now I want you to see this. this these few verses, these few conversations of Jesus are really important. I want you to see this. If Jesus didn't come and spend forty days on the earth. They would have never believed in the resurrection, right? If let's say that that Jesus didn't appear to them, Mary and he raised from the dead. Even if he did, let's say he rose from the dead, and the and and the, they didn't they didn't see him. Mary and all the rest of the ladies that went to prepare his body would have found an empty tomb. They would have believed it was grave robbers. They would have come back if nobody had, if Jesus hadn't encountered the women and Jesus didn't encounter the people of the Emmaus and Jesus didn't encounter Peter and Jesus didn't come and stand in front of all of them. He says, he says, why are you so full of doubt? See, Jesus says that. He says, look, why are you so full of doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Look at the, the scars that I have. It's me. Why are you so... so they would not have believed uh -huh. if Jesus didn't spend this 40 days with them. And it couldn't have been just this time and he goes away. He had to spend an amount of time with them long enough that they would understand what was going on, that they would truly believe in the resurrection. It couldn't, And it couldn't be just these 11 and a few other followers and the women. It couldn't be just them. First of all, if it was just the women, nobody would believe them because no. they're women, right? I'm sorry, but that's the way and it the, was. There were second rate citizens. The second rates, the nobody would believe them. So that wouldn't that wouldn't matter. If these two if the if it if if it was just these people so far that we see in these first five appearances, nobody would believe them. That's why you go back to for the the Corinthians, First Corinthians fifteen five, and it says that there were he met he saw over five hundred at one time, and then many other times that we don't have recorded, Jesus met with people during that forty days. Why? Because he wants people to believe in the resurrection. Why in the resurrection? Because the resurrection is 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 his resurrection power. Remember, he said, I'm going to lay down my life when I want to, and I'm going to pick it up when I want to. It's I'm the one doing that. It's his power. Yeah. It's his power over death, which means that everything he said before that now becomes true. The resurrection didn't make those things come true. It put an exclamation point on them to say, look, it is true. It's a it's a wow, this is true conversation. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it it puts exclamation point up the very thing when he when he's when he was in his ministry, look, this is who I am, this is why I truly you know, um 
who I say I am. You know, I, I mean, me and the Father are one. If you've seen the Father, you've seen me. And right. they're like, wait a minute, what? Yeah, so but, that, yeah, 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 perfect. And so here it shows us, but when you look at the Old Testament, you read the New Testament, what we are as sinful people, we always require a sign. We require a sign. And so like what Rick is talking about, he's given them physical, tangible signs to see, look, this is who I am. You know, so yes. Well, and he says, don't doubt. Now look, oh, the, no. these guys walked with him. They saw him do the miracles. They saw him do all these things. Remember, we've been studying this from Matthew 5 on through for seven well, months. Yeah. We've been seeing miracle after miracle after miracle. We've been seeing all these things happen. But they still didn't believe. Even though they saw the empty tomb, they didn't believe. They didn't believe any, until they saw Jesus himself. Did Peter didn't believe. <laughs> the only one who really believed was was John, right? Peter did not believe until Jesus shows up in this fifth appearance. Now, let's go on. There is some debate as to whether he appears to them a second time that night. The the the, the John and the Luke accounts have significantly different descriptions of the appearance on that first Sunday evening. It is merely a different recounting of the same appearance. So that's what this that's what this person believes. They or is it wholly separate? I think it's the it's the account of the same one. It doesn't really matter. You read it how you want to. The point is is that he appeared to them. That's the point. It is not possible to say for sure which one it really is. Nevertheless, this is what this author says. Nevertheless, since the descriptions are so different, we can call the this appearance six in John twenty nineteen. Okay. Or it might be a different telling of appearance five. We're not sure. So that's why it's important to, when we're talking about the appearances, if it's the same thing or not. But who knows? So let's just call it six. Okay. And now there is no biblical account of Jesus appearing to anyone during the week that followed. The next account of the resurrection says eight days later, namely the following Sunday. Okay. Do you know what the apostles exclaimed? Uh, what the apostles uh, exclaimed to Thomas that they had seen the Lord, uh, but that he refused to believe it. He, that G, P P Thomas is not going to believe it. He refused. They said, "Look, we've seen him." The, the people from Emmaus say, "We've seen him." You know, all the other apostles say, "We've seen him." He appeared to us. He's, the, the women say, "We've seen him." He appeared to us. All that stuff, and he would just not pay. He was not going to have any of it until he saw him. He was not going to have any of it. Now, what does that tell you if he doesn't appear, if Jesus doesn't appear? These people are going to say, I, it, it's not, it did not happen. It's, it didn't happen. I don't care what you thought you saw. I didn't see it. It didn't happen. That's what's going to happen here. So, so that's why Jesus has to spend this, uh, this longer than a week period, this 40 days on the earth. The, uh, the apostles, uh, Let's see, there were, the, were the apostles uh, were the apostles nervous that Jesus had not appeared each uh, again each day? I don't know. We do not know. There are no accounts of what happened during this interlude. So for a week, Jesus doesn't show up. I imagine during that week, Satan is very active. Oh, he, he is. <laughs> and what do you think Satan's doing? Well, for them, they lack themselves because they were afraid. The uh, the disciples had locked themselves that whole time from the first to the second appearance, so you know he's telling them that didn't happen. It's not real. So what <laughs> Satan's doing is he's throwing doubt, doubt. on them. Doubt. He Fear. is sowing doubt. He is sowing the seed of doubt, and and <laughs> you know what that that's that's a that's a sermon right there. We don't have time to preach a sermon about that, but that's a sermon there. When you don't connect with the Lord. Satan takes that time that you take a, a hiatus or a, an absence from Christ and reading his word and praying with him. He takes that time and he sows seeds of doubt in your life constantly. Yeah, John was so specific and the doors were locked. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very specific. So, it. <laughs> so he sows seeds of doubt. Satan sows seeds of doubt. Okay. Now, appearance number seven. Jesus once again appears to the gathered disciples. This time, Thomas is with them. Okay? So he calls Thomas to faith. He says, Thomas, I want you to believe. And Thomas now confesses Jesus to be Lord and God. This is John 20, 24 through 29. Do you have it? You have it there, don't you? Yeah. Do you want to read it? Starting where? 24. 
423. <laughs> you, you, the reason I laughed last time is because I say 24. Let me read 23. So that, 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 oh, I do that put thing in I, I know because it's all in. It's well, all this way you don't have to. This oh, okay. gives you a count. <laughs> it was just funny to me. Sorry. Right. One, of the, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with them. With the others when Jesus came, they told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I, will not, I won't believe it unless I see the nails in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the room on his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. And Jesus says, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound <coughs> in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And then Thomas exclaimed, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Right. Right. I'm sorry it's not cold. That's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, see? So Thomas is not going to believe. But then he says, blessed are those who believe who haven't seen me. Because Jesus knows that he has to go. Why do you think the ascension was so important? Why do you think they needed to have the ascension? The ascension was important what? because... Jesus is going to appear to them on and off for 40 days. As he does, there's got to be a there's got to be an endpoint to that. It's like a period at the end of a sentence so that Jesus says, "Okay, now I'm ascending to the Father. So you're not going to see me like this anymore." So that's what happens. That's why the ascension is important so that there's a, a beginning of this 40-day period and an ending of this 40-day period. And they didn't know it was a 40-day period. They had no idea. We do because we can look back on it. But they didn't know how long right. God, Jesus was going to continue to appear to them. So anyway, so now we have seven appearances. The apostle had received, the apostles then received instructions to return to Galilee. That's Matthew 28 and Mark 16, where they would see Jesus. Thus they spent some of, of this interlude journeying 60 miles to the north, a trip that would have taken a considerable amount of time. We can imagine them taking the trek north during the intervening days. So there's some time period. They go north. They're instructed to go north. Uh, the time frame of the next a, a, approach, uh, apparent, excuse me, is somewhat vague. John merely says, after this. So John doesn't tell you how long. The first time it said eight days, but now it's, it's after this. It is likely a matter of days or a week at best. The scene is at the Sea of Galilee. Not all the 12 are present. They, are go they had gone fishing, and Jesus summons them from the lakeside. You remember this? Okay. They came to the shore and see him. That's appearance number eight. Uh, they're out fishing. Jesus tells them to come to the shore. They don't, they don't know who it is when he first says come to the shore. Then they then they come closer and they see him. He's got a fire there, doesn't he? Yeah. And he's feeding. They eat together, doesn't he? Doesn't know what happens there or not? Or is that a different place? I'm reading that. It says at dawn in verse 4, he was yeah. standing at the beach, but the disciples could not see him. And then he asked them a question, fellas, have you caught any fish? And no, they replied. Keep reading? Yeah. Then he said, he said to them in verse 6, throw throw your net on, onto the right side of the boat, and you'll you'll get some. So they did, and they didn't they couldn't haul in the net because there were there were so many fish. Then the disciples then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, that's John, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard this, heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water and headed to the shore, and the others stayed within the boat and pulled the load, the loaded net at the shore, for they for they were only about a hundred yards from the shore, and when they when they got there, they found, yeah, breakfast was waiting for them. Yeah. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. And Jesus feeds them, yep. which is interesting. So this is the appearance number eight. And they're fishing afar off. They don't see what's going on. They can't tell who's on the shore, but they just see somebody waving them in. And, and ready. Yeah, and, and, they're, and so they're coming in, and they say, hey, have you caught anything? No, we'll put your fish. And then as soon as they... As soon as they catch the fish and they go, wow, this is, then they recognize, because they're close enough, they recognize Jesus and Peter jumps in the water and swims to him and, and, and uh, then they eat. They have, they have, Jesus has prepared breakfast for them. Um, 
the appearance to the 500, okay, so that's the eighth appearance when that, when that miracle, and we all know that story of Jesus telling him to throw the nets on the other side and get the fish and come in and the nets are so full and all that. We all know that story. The problem is we don't know that it's with the resurrected Christ. We just think it's Jesus. We don't know that it's the resurrected Jesus, right? And so that's important. It's really important. Why? Because what did Jesus do there? Jesus is still providing for them, right? He provides for them these fish. So now they have fish. They'll take all these fish to the market. They'll have finances in their coffers. They'll, he's taking care of them. He takes care of them. He still feeds them. He still cares for them. He cares about what happens to them in their physical life. So he, he has food prepared for them. This is, this is what this is Jesus is constantly teaching us. He is always there to care for us. He's always there to prepare things for us. He loves us. You're his family. You're his children. And what he I wants like, to care about you. Yeah, go ahead. What I also like is because in that, then he reinstates Peter, and you see how yes, God yes. loves you if you mess up. Yeah. Jesus, look. Yeah. I love you. Yeah. And I just yeah. say that you're sorry, and I forgive you. So right. that's another thing you see yeah. that he does with Peter. Yeah, Peter at that point is... It, but not until this appearance does that happen, yeah. which is interesting. Because Peter, we don't know what, what Jesus has said to Peter. Um, the first meeting of, with Peter, that, that we saw when, when Peter went away from the other 11 and was by himself somewhere and Jesus appeared to him. And then Peter comes back and says, he's, a, he's risen. And, and then they believe. But we don't know if Jesus at, at that point says, Peter, look, you're okay. I mean, I imagine the first thing out of Peter's mouth was, you're alive. I imagine the second thing out of Peter's life, as out of his mouth, was, "Man, I am so sorry." Look, look. I mean, because I'm sure Peter was carrying that guilt from all that stuff, but he does. He is reinstated. Here. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so, so there, it might be. It might be that you know, it's just like us. Once we sin, sometimes we need more than one assurance, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and the beauty of God now, <clears throat> well, Christ, who sits at the right hand of the Father right now. He's your high priest, and so you can approach him at any time. You know, yeah. you don't have to wait for any miracle, whatever it may be. But you know, you you can. Yeah, we have direct access twenty four seven to the Father through Christ. That's yeah. the beauty. Yeah. And the thing again, the thing, yeah, and again, the thing about Peter is that he has an assurance. He keeps being reassured by Jesus that he's okay, that his sin is forgiven, that what he did was was what he did, and God knows how to work around all of that stuff. What Satan meant for evil, God will bring to good. I mean, that kind of conversation is the conversation, I think, that Jesus had with Peter uh, uh, probably every time he saw Peter. But then he gets reinstated here. And this reinstatement is probably the last time that Peter, because this is the third time that Peter's seen him. That's an interesting conversation too, right? Oh. That the third time he really gets it. Feed my, what did Jesus say? Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. What did, how many times did Peter deny him? Three times. You know, this is the third time that Peter is seeing Jesus alive after the resurrection. And guess what? <laughs> you know, this is interesting. Anyway, the appearance of the 500 of all the appearances, you might think that this one would have been recorded in some detail since it was the most widely experienced. It uh, would seem that many accounts would have existed and that at least one would have uh, made its way into the scriptures. Yet, this is the only place, yet there is no account of it other than that it, that it did in fact happen here. Paul records the fact of his appearance in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. He then, appears, he then appeared to uh, more than 500 brethren. This is what it says, quote, He then appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Most of them are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. That is the ninth appearance. Yep. Where did this take place? Uh, what was it like? Uh, <laughs> what was the reaction? We don't know. We, we really don't know. We simply do not know. Proof, once again, that the Bible is not a history book in the conventional sense. Rather, it is a highly selective telling of what took place, not a complete account. The Bible makes no claims to be something it is not. It is quite clear that it is a selective book. John 20, verse 30. Yeah, the one person that we see that out of these 500, because it mentions James, the half-brother of Jesus, mm -hmm. we see the change in him because he denied Jesus, didn't believe that he was the Messiah. Later on, he writes, you know, about Jesus. So that's the only person that we know that does an account different apart from this because he wrote a book. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Sorry. Well, I'm just saying 
James, the half brother of Jesus, becomes a leader in the church. I'm just saying, you see the byproduct of because he didn't believe. Not even so. You're see, you're saying that James was a part of the 500. I don't know. Was he? I mean, I don't know. I'm asking. I don't know what you're saying. I'm 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 trying to follow you. I'm sorry. I didn't get it. Because here it says. What does it say? Yeah. Why don't you read it? That oh yeah. Let, let's read it. Let's read it. Okay. Starting at uh, verse five, and after the. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of them still alive, though some had died. Then he was seen by James yeah, and oh, later oh, yeah, by that's, all... That's a different time. Then oh, he was seen oh okay, James. okay. So gotcha. yeah, so he's, he was seen by the 500. Then, and then, that's, then okay, after that, he gotcha. was seen by James. And the, so the yeah, that's a list. Yeah, absolutely. That's good. Yes. That's good, Uriel. That's a list of, of, of um, who sees him. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're right. Then by James, okay. Now I get what you're saying. Sorry, I thought you were talking about James. I thought no, you were no, saying no, that. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's good. I, that's really good. I appreciate it. I'm just trying to catch up to you. Thank you. So anyway, so this is that's appearance number nine. Then the, number ten is the appearance in on here of James. Yes. Um, the appearance of James is the next one. Uh, here again, we do not have a description of this appearance. Only a remark by Paul found in what what. Uh, was just read by Uriel in 1 Corinthians fifteen seven. So that's good. The, there's the appearance to James. So that's the 10th appearance. The time frame of this appearance is not clear. It doesn't tell us when all this happened, but it tells us sequentially what happened. And if you go back to 1 Corinthians uh, 15, it, it, there's a sequence of what happens, right? Yeah. In fifteen five, it says he appears to, to 500, right? Yep. And then it says to James. And then does, what does it say after that? And then later by all the apostles. Yeah. And then last of all, though I had not been born at, though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Right. So then Paul sees him. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sequence of when, when things happen. We know that. So the 10th appearance is the appearance to James. <laughs> Excuse me. Um. <clears throat> Uh, Jesus certainly had other appearances uh, to and with the disciples that we don't have listed. Luke attests to this in Acts when he writes. He writes this in the book of Acts. Uh, well, look, what's Acts one three says? That that that's a pretty cool scripture, honestly. Acts one three. Yeah, Acts one It says, and during the 40 days after his, after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Okay, so, so Luke records this for Theophilus, who is a, who is a, the book of Acts is written to O Theophilus, and the O, for, before the word Theophilus, the name Theophilus is to show a, uh, sign of respect or a place of honor. So this man was some kind of an honorable civic leader or some kind of a leader, probably. And um, he's writing this and he says that during the 40 days, so so Luke even calls it a 40 day period. And he says he appeared and he appeared for several reasons. The proof that he, what he did was he appeared proving that he was alive and, and he appeared um, 40 days and what he spoke about was the kingdom of God so he wanted them to understand again the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of God really was and so during that 40 day time he appeared to them many times and, and he and he brought proof of his of his of his resurrection and he brought information about the kingdom of God and he wanted them to know that he that he was alive and, and that his passion was still the same as it was before he passed away. And so that's why he, that's why I think Luke tells us why he took that time to do that. So now that's the 10th appearance that we have. Now on the list, during this time, there is perhaps the one appearance, excuse me, we can attribute specifically to this time period as recorded both in Matthew and in Mark, Matthew 28, 16 and Mark 16, 14. It takes place on mountain top on a mountaintop in Galilee Mark adds that they were reclined that they were reclining at table I refer to this appearance time frame uncertain as appearance 11 this is what our writer says here it is here that Jesus gives the great commission 
Although Mark's text may seem to imply that Jesus was taken up from this mountain, such a conclusion is a rash since Mark only indicates that Jesus ascended only after he had spoken to them. So we're not sure when that happened. But if you read Matthew 28, are you in, are you in Mark? You're in Mark 16, 14? Mm -hmm. What do you want, Matthew? It doesn't matter. You're there. It's fine if you're there. Mark 16, 14. What does Mark 16, 14 say? Still later, he appeared to the 11 disciples as they were eating together. He rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. Okay, now watch. Now watch. This is pretty interesting, right? Jesus comes. And they've seen him already. This is the 11th appearance, right? And he's appeared to 500. He's done all this stuff. He's, 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 and, and he, he, they're eating together. And he comes, he shows up, and he, and he rebukes them. He gives them a, a their comeuppance. <laughs> they get in trouble. Does, that's like the only time you see, <laughs> with a few passages we read, that's when he rebukes, like, when they when they're like doubting in him, you know. Well, this then yeah, read that again. I think this is a great passage because because he's like a dad, and he comes and he says, "Look, son, you I you've seen me. What's the problem? <laughs> you know that anyway. Go read it again. This is good." It says, "Still later, he appeared to eleven disciples as they were eating together. He rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had raised." From the dead. Okay, he refused. They refused to believe, right? Yeah. Those who had seen him refused to believe after he'd been written. They had seen him, and they still refused to believe. So he comes and he says, "Will you just just get it together, kids? It's it's time for you to to really believe in who I am and who I say I am." Now that's the eleventh appearance. We have uh, twelve appearances, and we got two minutes, so we better hurry up here. Um, Let's let's kind of just skip ahead to that twelfth appearance, okay? And so we can be done with this today. Um, after forty days of appearances and instructions, we have a final account of the last appearance, appearance number twelve, wherein he leads them to a place near Bethany, and this is the ascension, and gives them final instructions to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit is sent, and then he is taken up to heaven in their very sight. That's Acts 1, 1 through 11, or, or Luke 24, 50, and you're in Luke 24, 50 through 53. Let's read those three verses. 50, 53? Uh-huh. And he says, And then Jesus led them to Bethany and lifted his hands to heaven. He blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken to heaven. And so they worshipped him and then returned to Jerusalem, filled with great joy. And they spent all of their time in the temple praising God. Okay, so they weren't; they were no longer hiding, right? They had stopped the hiding. They were in public. They now believed in his. The, the forty days is over. His final appearance is when he is ascended to the Father. Now, why is he ascended to the Father? Because he gives them final instructions, and he tells them, "I'm going now to the Father, but I will send one to you who will who will now come as another Comforter. He sends the Paraclete. Now he sends the Paraclete." And when he sends the paraclete, that's the Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside of you and does for you what you cannot do. He does that, and so they go back, and they go to the temple, and then they go wait in an upper room until they have been clothed with power from on high, it tells us in the last of the book of Luke, and in the first of the of, of the uh, of Acts of the Apostles. But really quick, verse 7, yeah. verse 7 through 8, he says this, before he ascended to heaven. The Father alone has... The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and the times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Yeah. So he gives them the Great Commission again. And he says, look, this is who you're going to be, this is what you're going to do, and now you believe in me, and now it's time for me to ascend to the Father and send the Holy Spirit. So they're supposed to go wait, their instructions were to go wait till they had been clothed with power. Which is the next Manhattan, chapter. Which is the next chapter, chapter. yeah. Which is, which is Acts, in the book of Acts. But he talks about it both in the book of Acts and in the book of Luke, because Luke is the one who records that ascension to the Father. So now, those are the 12 appearances. Those are the 40 days. We've kind of got, gone through it really quickly. Why is that important for us? And it's 11.01, we have to go. Look, it's important for us to know this. 
because whatever Jesus says, he will do. He's not like a, an earthly husband like me who says, yeah, I'll pick that up and then doesn't do it. You, you ever get in trouble from your wife for doing that? I do oh, all the time, man. I just She says something wrong with you. I said, yeah, I guess there is. You know? The longer we've been married, <laughs> yeah. the less it happens. No, not me. I'm just as dumb as I ever was. <laughs> I just obey and say yes. But, you know, how many times do we do we say something and not follow through? If we can do it 80% of the time, we think we're doing great. Jesus does it 100% of the time. Whatever Jesus says happens. Whatever he tells you is going to take place, he will do. Whatever care he says he's going to take over you and for you and in you, he will. God loves you. You are his favorite. And he came so that you might know him. He came that you might know his great and wonderful mercy, his great and wonderful grace. He came that you might know his resurrected power. You might know it and you might experience it and you might share it. That's what he came for. He wants you to have the authority that he gives you, and the authority he gives you is the authority from the resurrected power. He now has all authority on heaven and earth. We read that yesterday. Look, God bless you. You are his favorite. We will see you Sunday. Today's Friday. We will see you Sunday at 9.33 here on our campus. We're going a little bit early so that so that the sun doesn't get warm on us, you know, too warm on us. We want some sun, but we don't want to get baked. We want to come and we want to have a comfortable time really worshiping the Lord. It's going to be in the parking lot. It will be amazing. You're going to have the best time. Please bring all your friends and come and celebrate because we can have a lot of people here and we, we're going to have a lot of fun time in our parking lot worshiping God together. Look it. We love you. God bless you. See you Sunday morning at 933.